Um, right, so hello and welcome to the second in this series of disability benefits workshops with Lupus UK. Uh, my name is Zulika Lebeau and to describe myself for anyone listening, I am a white presenting mixed race woman with lots of curly red hair. I'm wearing a bright yellow jumper and I am in front of a very overstacked white bookshelf. I'm the founder of Chronic Creatives, which is um, a platform dedicated to supporting artists who are chronically ill or disabled. And we have been working with Lupus UK to bring you these workshops over the next few weeks. I am joined today by Louise Galinsky, who is a member of Chronic Creatives and a disability benefits expert and she will be delivering the talk today. Louise, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name's Louise. For those who are listening, I'm a white woman with white hair with some color in it. Um, I'm wearing glasses and also a green dress with animal print on it. As Zulika has said, I am a member of Chronic Creatives. Um, I have generalized osteoarthritis and uh, had the first of two hip replacements uh, last summer. I'm a solicitor, I've been qualified for 38 years and for 24 of those years, I've specialized amongst other things in disability benefits. So the talk today is on the mobility component of the personal independence payment for those of you who might have been here last week, there will be some repetition of information, but the, the nub of the presentation will be about uh, how to obtain or hopefully obtain the mobility component. If you can hear snoring, it's not me, it's my dog who is on the sofa with me. Okay, please uh, bear with us while I get the presentation up and then we'll get going. Okay, so this is the introduction to the mobility component of PIP. The image on the right hand side uh, just shows various conditions for which claiming PIP may be possible. Next slide, please. This is an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So what is PIP? A brief history of disability benefits, legal points you need to know, the mobility rates, most important filling in the application form, what happens at your assessment, and then what to do should your application be refused, including how to appeal and the hearing. At the end, I'll give you some tips which are generalized about filling in the PIP form and also give you some resources which may be useful to you. Next slide, please. Okay, so the personal independence payment, otherwise known as PIP, is the most recent uh, non-means tested disability benefit. So basically it's extra money to help you with the additional expenses that disability brings. So you can claim it if you have a, an illness, disability or mental health condition. As I've said, it's a point-based system, and I'll speak more about that later. You can get it if you're also getting the employment and support allowance component of universal credit or other benefits as it's non-means tested. Your income savings and whether you're working or not don't affect your eligibility, but the work you do may affect eligibility, for example, if you work as a chef, but state in your form under the daily living section that you can't cook for yourself, then there's an inherent contradiction there. Next form, uh, next slide, please. 
We now have a definition of disability, courtesy of the Equality Act 2010. So that states you're disabled if you have a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term negative effect on your ability to carry out everyday activities. Next slide, please. Right, the welfare state is a relatively recent invention and was kicked off in 1942 with the Beveridge Report. William Beveridge was a social economist who was asked to frame uh, a report dealing with how the state could help citizens through, and I think it, the phrase was from the cradle to the grave. This was eventually instituted in 1948, and Beveridge's idea was to uh, get all citizens of working age, age to pay a contribution known as the National Insurance Contribution uh, towards the cost of the NHS and the welfare state. It was envisaged initially as a stopgap benefit for people who were, found themselves unemployed for a while or sick for a while, widowed or retired. And it quickly mushroomed the first disability benefit as such linked to sickness was invalidity benefit, which then became incapacity benefit and then ESA. Non-means tested disability benefits started in 1982 with Disability Living Allowance, otherwise known as DLA. Some of you may be familiar with DLA, but that forms the subject of a later workshop. So we, we now have the definition of disability in the Equality Act from 2010, and the legislation for PIP came into being in 2012. Next slide, please. Right, as I've said, you can work and claim PIP. Your income or savings do not affect whether or not you receive the benefit. PIP is about functional capability, not about what's wrong with you. People can obviously experience the same illness differently. And so that's why it's your functional capability that's assessed. For example, one person with MS may be in a wheelchair while another leads a relatively normal life. So that's what's assessed, but obviously knowing what your illness is and knowing what difficulties that may bring is important. Functional capability is about a person's ability to perform tasks and activities that are necessary in their daily lives. And the key words are without assistance. So if you, you're able to perform some tasks, by yourself, but not others, you may be eligible. It's governed by the Social Security Personal Independence Payment Regulations 2013. Next slide, please. Regulations 4, 7 and 12 are especially relevant for claiming PIP. Regulation 4 states that anyone claiming PIP needs to be able to carry out the activities in the claim form safely to an acceptable standard, repeatedly and within a reasonable period of time. So for example, if you're able to walk 50 meters but have to stop halfway, and once you get to the end of your 50 meters, have to wait half an hour before you can walk back, that's not to an acceptable standard or within a reasonable time period. Regulation seven states that any difficulties you may have have to be present for at least 50% of the time. This is referred to as the 50% rule and is specifically the government's attempt to deal with fluctuating conditions like lupus, where people can have one symptom one day and a totally different set of symptoms the other day. Regulation 12 is about the qualifying period. 
and any condition for which you're claiming PIP needs to have been present for at least three months before the date of claim and for at least nine months after. So even if you don't have a diagnosis, you can still claim if the symptoms you are experiencing, which curtail your ability to look after yourself, have been present for these periods of time. I would say though at this point that you need to have logged them with your GP as otherwise the uh, date of claim may be shifted to a point where they are actually recorded in your GP's notes. Next slide, please. Once you've filed your application, you'll be referred for assessment. The assessors look at how you move around and then apply the regulations to determine whether or not you receive any points. Points awarded recognize the difficulty a claimant may have with the activities in the claim form. They're awarded on a sliding scale for each activity. Next slide, please. These are the rates for the mobility component. The lower or standard rate is £23.60 a week, and you need to accumulate at least eight points to get the lower rate. The higher or enhanced rate is £62.25 per week, and you need at least 12 points to receive the higher rate. If you do get the higher rate, you have the option not to actually receive the money, but to receive a motability vehicle instead. These are usually good cars, mostly SUVs, and your uh, PIP mobility higher rate will pay for nearly all the outgoings apart from petrol and that sort of thing. So obviously, if you need a car to get around, the higher rate is definitely what you need to get. Next slide, please. Filling in the claim form. The form is divided into activities of daily living and mobility. At the beginning of the form, there's the general information, name, address, national insurance number, GP, the name of any specialists that you're seeing, uh, a list of your conditions and also your medication. How you fill in the form is absolutely crucial and can determine the outcome of your claim. For example, if you have problems with walking, but just put, I can't walk 20 meters, that isn't going to tell the reader anything about what your difficulties are. So you need to specify what your difficulties are. Take pictures of or photocopy the claim form and anything else that you send in with it before you actually send it in so that you've got a record of what you sent in in case it's not received. Do get help if you need it. Your council website should have a list of organizations who offer a form filling service. A lot of these organizations won't be operating fully at the moment, but they may well still be able to help you. When listing your conditions in the claim form, list everything. If you don't have a diagnosis, list the symptoms you have been experiencing. And if you are waiting for a diagnosis, for example, you might put joint pain awaiting assessment for a from a rheumatologist. Next slide, please. On the actual claim form, only list your current medication and your current mobility aids if you use any. Don't list every medication you've ever had because that would just make things confusing. The assessors want to know how you are most of the time, not how you are at your best or worst. Don't be tempted just to fill it in as to how you are when you're in the middle of a flare up or something like that. 
but at the same time, don't underplay your symptoms. Tell it like it is. A lot of people with chronic illness, because they've got used to living with their symptoms, can underplay them. So do list everything that you suffer with on a daily basis. Try to be detailed but concise. If you write pages and pages, then important information may get lost in the middle. If you find writing things by hand challenging, you can type up or dictate your answers and attach these to the claim form. This is perfectly acceptable. And I've seen many forms that have been handed in in this way. Do include copies of letters you have from your GP or specialist with the claim form. For example, if you've been for tests and you have a letter sent to your GP, copy to you from your rheumatologist saying, Miss or Mr. X uh, came to see me with symptoms X, Y, Z. Following blood tests, it had been determined that she, he, she has lupus type whatever. So that will help to conf confirm what you're saying. Next slide, please. The mobility activities are split into two. The first is planning and following a journey, which is really a, an attempt to cover people with uh, anxiety and depression, cognitive problems, memory loss, brain damage and or learning disabilities. It covers problems with both familiar and unfamiliar journeys. And you will be asked whether you need the aid of another person, an assistance dog or orientation aid, e.g. a long cane or apps such as Trekker Breeze. And Overwhelmingly, it covers those who struggle to make journeys as a result of mental health difficulties in particular. People with brain damage or cognitive problems, depending on um, what is wrong with them, won't usually reach the appeal stage and will be weeded out and given award um, at, at the start. People with enduring mental health problems have more difficulties because often they don't state exactly what the problems are. They can have real difficulties filling in the form. And so if you come into this category, don't be afraid to seek help. Now, for planning and following a journey, if, for example, you need prompting to get out of the house to be able to undertake any journey, to avoid overwhelming psychological distress, you can get four points. If you cannot follow the route of a familiar journey without another person, assistance dog, or an orientation aid, that will give you 12 points. So say for the sake of argument, you're, suff you're somebody who suffers from agoraphobia and you need a push both to get out of the house and you need someone with you to go on any journey at all, familiar or unfamiliar, then you may be able to get 12 points. The other part of the claim form for mobility is physical difficulty with walking less than 200 meters. This covers the use of a walking aid or whether you need help from another person. For example, if you can stand and then move between 50, but no more than 200 meters, aided or unaided, that will give you four points. If you can't either aided or unaided, stand and move more than one meter, that will give you 12 points. Very few people actually come within that category. Most people who will get uh, the higher rate of the mobility component for walking, get it for being able to stand and then move one to 20 meters. The biggest difficulty most claimants have with filling in about walking is being able to judge how far they can walk. Most people, including myself, are rubbish at estimating distances. 
one thing I've learned is that it's always further than you think. So then 50 meters is actually a reasonable space to walk. So if you can use your phone or whatever else you, you may have available to actually track how far you can walk. If you can walk to your bus stop, you may be able to say, it takes me three minutes to get to the bus stop and I walk at a very slow pace. There is information online which translates what fast, medium and slow paces mean into general walking ability in terms of actual meters. So do try and solidify um, how far you can actually walk as uh, that will be useful when you fill in the form. People often put in outrageous claims and then change them at a later date. So don't overclaim, but do state exactly what your problems are with walking. For example, I can walk to my local shop, which is about 50 to 60 meters away, but I will need to stop on the way because of knee and lower back pain. If there is somewhere for me to sit, I will sit down. If not, I will stand for a couple of minutes and will then be able to get to the shop. Once I've gone to the shop, I will have to rest for five minutes in order to be able to walk back and will then have to stop after a further 20 meters on the way back. So that's just an example of how being reasonably precise over the distances you can walk, why you can't walk and why you may have to stop will help you. Next slide, please. Your claim form will be used as part of the assessments. It's important that the evidence you put in your claim form is consistent with what you tell your assessor and their observations of you. For example, if you put in the claim form that you can walk uh, 50 to 200 meters, but tell the assessor you can't walk 20 meters, they will want to know what's happened in the interim as to why uh, you can walk so much less than you stated in your claim form. Don't forget when you go for your assessment at the time when face-to-face -face assessments are reinstated, that the assessor will be observing you from the moment you get out of your chair in the waiting room, right through your walk into their room and when you sit down. Points, if any, are usually assigned at your assessment, but can be added later by a DWP official called a decision maker. The assessment is carried out by a healthcare professional or HCP, who may be anyone from a paramedic to a physiotherapist or doctor. It's possible that the HCP who assesses you may not be a specialist in your condition, as they are looking at what you are or are not able to do as a result of your condition, not the condition yourself. If you can, take someone with you to the assessment so that if necessary, they can give evidence as to what took place. For example, if the HCP's report states that they examined you when you say they didn't, the person you take with you may be able to confirm that. The DWP has its own complaint system if you feel the assessment was unfair or unsatisfactory. Next slide, please. You'll receive a letter following your assessment detailing the decision that has been taken. If you disagree with this decision, you have one month from the date on the decision letter to apply for a mandatory reconsideration or MR. The MR means that a, a new decision maker will look at your case again. And this step has to be taken before you can appeal. If you ask for an MR, include any ev evidence you have that you've not previously sent in, but it has to be evidence that relates directly to the time around your claim. 
if you have a new condition which has arisen since then, that won't be looked at. The decision will be looked at again and you will then receive another letter. If the decision remains unchanged following the MR, you then have one month from the date on the MR letter within which to appeal. Next slide, please. You can appeal by letter or by filling in the specific appeal form on gov.uk. You can ask for an appeal in person or for your appeal to be on the papers only. At the moment, appeals are being carried out remotely on the telephone. That's shortly going to change to video and eventually their face-to-face appeals will be reinstated depending what happens, uh, of course, with COVID. The DWP will put together an appeal bundle containing your claim form, the assessment report, any extra evidence you've sent in, and all the decisions that have been taken. Your case will be allotted a date and the appeal bundles will be sent to you and the tribunal. Do read or have read over to you the appeal bundle. I see a lot of people who haven't read the bundle and then don't know what's in it. It is absolutely crucial that you've read everything in it and so can make comments when directed to this page or that page. The tribunal is a three person panel, which includes a judge, a doctor, usually a retired GP and a disability qualified member or DQM. The DQM may be someone like an occupational therapist, a carer for a disabled person, or someone with direct experience of disability, such as blindness, MS, ME, uh, brittle bone disease, anything. Next slide, please. You can take a representative if you have one, or other, companion, or other companion to the hearing with you. Your representative doesn't have to be a legal professional. It can be your friend, your sister, your mum, anybody. Uh, the judge will introduce the panel members and tell you what will happen during the hearing and will also explain the role of the representative in the hearing if there's someone who hasn't experienced that before. There may be a rep present from the DWP to state their case, the tribunal will not know in advance whether or not someone like this will be in attendance. The DWP rep basically repeats how the decision was taken and will answer questions from the panel, you or your representative if you have one. All three tribunal members will ask you questions about your functional capability. They will have read what's in the bundle, but remember that all they know about you is what's in the bundle. So if on looking through the bundle, you realize important points have been left out, then do state them. Now, this is very important. The tribunal is not looking at how you are on the date of the hearing. It looks at how you were at the date the first decision was made, which may be some time before your actual hearing takes place. So you have to try and remember back to the date of the decision and how you were then. Any deterioration in your condition since the date of decision is not taken into account. Next slide, please. At the hearing, you'll be given an opportunity to add anything which you feel has been left out in the tribunal's questioning of you. So it's important to list everything before you go in that you feel it's important to tell the panel and to then consult it and see what may not have been covered to that point. Your representative can point out important evidence in the bundle and will be invited to state which points they think apply. 
Your companion, if you have one, can give evidence, but it's important that they don't interfere with the hearing and don't prompt you when you're giving your evidence. The decision may be given to you on the day if the tribunal has time or else will be sent in the post. If the decision is given to you on the day and the decision has gone against you, unfortunately, the tribunal is not permitted to engage with you as to why they turned you down. There's a separate procedure whereby you can find that out and you will be informed of that at the time. Next slide, please. Pit tips. It, it, it's worth repeating. Remember to list all your conditions on the claim form. Think carefully about how you have adapted to be able to move around safely. For example, if you have strategically placed pieces of furniture in your home to enable you to keep your balance, if that's a problem, when you're walking around your home. So if you've done that, talk about that in your claim form. Include any aids which have been fitted in your home to help you to walk around, e.g. rails. Report all your symptoms to your GP so that they are on your medical records. The tribunal will frequently request copies of medical records, so it's important that you've told everything to your GP. Don't be shy of getting help if you need it and do not underplay your symptoms. Because you're used to dealing with your condition on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't mean that your symptoms aren't valid. So do not underplay what you're dealing with on a daily basis. Next slide, please. Here are some resources that you may find useful. For form filling services, you can visit scope.org.uk, the CABs, or your local council's website. As I've said, many of these organisations aren't functioning normally at the moment, but they may still be able to help you out. Lupus UK also have a range of sources available on their website, including an article on managing your finances. If you want to get technical, do read the Sweet and Maxwell Social, Social Security legislation handbooks. They offer a lot of information, including upper tribunal and court of appeal decisions on, for example, what constitutes functional capability, but they are hard going. So don't bother reading them unless you really want that in-depth kind of knowledge, or if you may be suffering from insomnia and want something to send you off to sleep. The Child Poverty Action Group Welfare Benefits Handbook is, I think, the best one, and it provides easy to understand information. Unfortunately, it is quite expensive. So do go on to your local library website and see if um, a copy is available digitally, particularly because the libraries are closed at the moment anyway. The gov.uk website also has a lot of useful information on benefits and eligibility and what you can or cannot claim. Finally, the Disability Law Service provides free advice for disabled people. So do avail yourself of their help if you need it. So thank you very much, everyone. We'll now have a short break and then I'll answer your questions. Sorry about that, everyone. My uh, computer had a little freak out there. As Louise said, um, we'll have a short break. I suggest that we come back at um, 4.40 and we'll uh, do the Q&A then. So um, please write all of your questions in the chat that you have. Um, alternatively, um, you, you can come on camera if you, if you want to do that, but the chat box is, is open for any questions. Thanks everyone, see you at 4.40.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, give everybody a couple of seconds to come back. If you could just um, type something in the chat, let us know that you're back and uh, we'll start with the questions. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Yes, great. Didn't want to start answering anybody's question before they had come back from their little mini break. So that's good. Um, okay, so thank you so much for that, Louise. I really, um, we really appreciate your expertise here. Um, the first question that I'd like to come to is um, what happens if you appeal after the tribunal stage? and they still do not take your condition and symptoms seriously? In order to appeal from the tribunal, you can only appeal on a point of law or if the tribunal misdirected itself on the facts. Very few cases actually make it to a positive decision in the upper tribunal. The most common uh, reason why cases succeed at the upper tribunal is that the tribunal did not properly consider A, B or C. But usually if you just disagree with what the tribunal said, that won't win you uh, a subsequent appeal. It's very difficult to get a reconsideration if you simply don't disagree, don't agree with what the tribunal said. You can apply for something called a statement of reasons in which the judge sets out how the tribunal arrived at their decision. And that will tell you all the evidence that they took into account. Just the fact that you don't feel they took your symptoms seriously will not in itself uh, get you a further successful decision at a later date. That is very complicated. I've given you a very brief explanation there. Okay. Um, what well, one question I have, I would like to clarify a little bit is, um, what happens if say for the sake of argument um the complainant has a has an issue with the hcp and then if, they refer to that within the tribunal and then the tribunal sort of takes the side of the hcp and doesn't um take the side of the claimant right if the claimant is dissatisfied with the hcp in any way they have to complain under the dwp's own complaint system Complaints about the HCP are not dealt with in the tribunal. What is dealt with in the tribunal is the law, the application of the law and the evidence. So the fact that someone has complained to the DWP about the HCP may be useful for the tribunal to know. And if they see that letter and they see why the person complained, and what in particular they're complaining about, that may be very helpful. I want to stress that if the tribunal turns um, an appeal down, they are not, quote, siding with the HCP, unquote. What they may be saying is that they feel the HCP's evidence is more compelling than that of the appellant. They don't take sides one way or the other. Okay, so it's it's from a it's very legal in terms of it's a legal standpoint they're taking in terms of compelling evidence. Yes, yes. I mean, even if they think the appellant is a, a real nasty piece of work, if um, the evidence is compelling towards them receiving benefit, they will get their benefit. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, Louise. Um, the next question we have is how do you approach a further reconsideration or write a powerful complaint? Are you talking about a complaint to the DWP here? 
Um, that person has not specified that. Um, I think in terms of how, how maybe start with the first question of how to um, how to approach a, a, a mandatory consideration. Oh, right. In an MR, you will have had the um, you may well have had the assessment report. And this is why another reason why it's important to take someone with you. So you can say that, for example, um, Uh, I have osteoarthritis in my hips, knees and ankles. The HCP did not examine me. The HCP has said that I walked 40 metres from um, the seat in the waiting room to their room. But in fact, this is untrue. I had to stop halfway and lean on my friend in order to be able to get there at all. So you're looking at stuff that they've left out. In, in your MR and also bringing to the attention of the decision maker things that the HCP may have glossed over. For example, particularly pe for people with mental health difficulties, they often um, make light of anxiety. So if you're somebody who say for the sake of argument has OCD and you need to be prompted to leave the house at all, and will then check the door 20 times. I saw somebody once who had to check his front door 20 times before he could walk down the road. So then you need to emphasize this in your MR letter if this isn't mentioned at all in the HCP's report and you know that you told them. Okay, okay. Um, so question three is more about mobility activities. Um, what if you are autistic and cannot use public transport due to triggers? Right, if uh, you're autistic, that is dealt with in planning and following a journey. And if you can't even follow a familiar journey, you will get 12 points and you'll be eligible for a motability car and you are now eligible also for a blue badge. Since last year, people with autism or severe learning difficulties can now get a blue badge on that basis. Previously, it was only a, open to people with actual mobility problems. Right, okay. So say for the sake of argument, um, I just wanna ask a clarifying question here. Say for the sake of argument, um, you write that in your claim form, how many points would that, that be worth? Is that dependent on what you can and can't do? Yes, uh, someone with severe autism should not usually reach appeal stage. Often they won't even get an assessment because when the claim form comes in, any forms that are immediately seen to be um, people with severe problems, are referred to a DWP doctor who will look at it and say, yeah, this person has severe autism. We've got this letter from their psychiatrist, which states that they're nonverbal, blah, blah, blah. Um, they won't even reach the stage of having an assessment. Okay, but less severe cases, that's where the, the, the waters get. There, there's, get there's, a gray, there's a gray area. And my own view is that the assessors don't deal very well as a rule with people with enduring mental health problems. Right, okay. So in that sense, it's very, very important to fill in the claim form as clearly as you can. Yes, so for example, um, if you suffer from periodic bouts of psychosis, but you haven't had one for say six years, that doesn't mean that you no longer have a mental health problem. That means that your mental health problem is only being controlled by medication and usually from support in the community. So you would say something like, the fact that I haven't had a psychotic episode for the last six years is only due to the fact that I have been switched from olanzapine to quetiapine and I have a carer who comes in every day to make sure that I have done whatever. The HCPs often fall into the trap of thinking that if you haven't been in hospital in the last year, that means you don't have a problem anymore. Right. 
Whereas the reality is that a lot of people with enduring mental health problems are kept stable only by leading a very narrow lifestyle and with a lot of support. Right, okay. Um, question four, if you are not called for PIP before you are 65, is it too late to apply? You won't be called for PIP. You have to apply for PIP. You can apply from the age of 16 to 65. Apologies, I should have mentioned this earlier. If you succeed in getting PIP before you're 65, you can continue to receive it after the age of 65, but there are restrictions on uh, the rate that you can get after 65. So you should definitely apply before you're 65. If you don't, from 65, the benefit is attendance allowance, which is totally different. Okay. Um, can a disability needs assessment from a university health team who are medical professionals um, who have already done a face-to-face -face assessment, can you use this in your, in your supporting evidence to apply? Absolutely, absolutely. If you have an assessment like that, or if say you have an occupational health assessment from your job, which will say uh, so-and-so's uh, joint symptoms are now so bad that even with reasonable adjustments, they are no longer able to carry out whatever job it was. Um, all that you should definitely include with your application. Right, okay. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions from anyone? I can see 22 comments in the chat. Yes, we've gone, we've gone through them. <laughs> oh, we've gone through them, okay. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, um, I'm going to, to look back. Yes, I think we've gone through them all. Does anyone have want to unmute themselves and uh, have a question uh, which they want to ask directly? 